Welcome to Books of Our Time, produced by the Massachusetts School of Law. Today we shall discuss a book which prescribes changes that should be made in order to obtain much better, yet much less expensive, medical care. The book is Redefining Healthcare, co-authored by Professors Elizabeth Teisberg of the University of Virginia and Michael Porter of Harvard. Professor Teisberg is with me to discuss their views, one might say their prescriptions. And I am Lawrence R. Velvel, the Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Thank you, Elizabeth, for coming from Charlottesville. Thank you. Uh, and I guess more laterally from Cambridge, where you spent a day or something like that. Uh, uh, neither you nor uh, Michael Porter uh, are medically trained. You're business economists, essentially. You each teach in a business school, or perhaps he teaches in the Kennedy School as well. Uh, how did you get interested in writing a book about health care? And what did you have to do to learn what you needed to know in order to write the book? When it comes to health care, everybody has a story. Um, everyone watching will have one or have a close friend or a relative who does. And we each do. And it was probably my stories or my family's stories that started this research. Mike and I started working on research in the health sector about 15 years ago. Um, uh, each of my kids have faced um, significant medical challenges at some point in their life. Uh, one of them uh, dealt with a situation that required some uh, pretty heroic surgery, and the other one was chronically ill and in pain for six years before we finally got a diagnosis. And it's amazing how fast yeah, yeah. human body heals with a correct diagnosis yeah. and effective care. Yeah. But it was those situations that drove us in the direction of looking at the paradoxes in the healthcare system. As to how we learned what we needed to know, for me, as the mother of a chronically ill child, um, carrying the child's health insurance and therefore having no choice about working, yeah. Um, yeah. I needed to be focused on the health sector. Yeah. Um, and I read and read and read and read during that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, so there was a lot of coming up the learning curve about the existing yeah. literature yeah. Yeah. Um, on various aspects of the problem that occurred during that time. And then most of the face-to-face uh, -face interviews have occurred over the space of the last three or four years. Yeah. Um, yeah. The book was written on the energy um, of, for me, the energy of two well kids. Right, right, right. Um, so uh, b before you published the book, or while you were doing your research, <clears throat> you talked, uh, obviously, I would gather, to a lot of doctors, a lot of HMO type people, a lot of hospital people, so on and so forth. Yeah. Originally, we had intended to write an article. Yeah. We had written an article about 12 years ago about the skewed incentives in the system, and in our studies had come to the conclusion that there was really a fundamental problem with the kind of competition that we have in healthcare today. And we, we started to write, we wrote an article on that, which we published in 2004. Yeah. The response to that article was overwhelming. Yeah. And while we expected to get uh, some defensive responses, what were we doing in this field, yeah. Yeah. the nature of this response was primarily people sending in examples saying, I didn't see this as part of a framework, but this is what I'm trying. It benefits my patients, and this is how it benefits me. Is this an example of what yeah, you're writing about? Yeah, yeah. And so this just overwhelming uh, yeah. response from people offering examples got us to the point where we said, we should write a book on yeah, this because yeah. there's clearly something yeah, happening. Yeah. The people being doctors, um, the people who responded being doctors. So in other words, uh, if you wrote your article in 2004 in, this, in your book, is uh, copyrighted 2006. You wrote the book in, well, basically less than two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Did you have to do any more research for it uh, and, or talk to any more people? Tons. But, tons. Yeah. yeah, the book goes way beyond yeah. the article. Yeah. Um, it was a, you know, night and day, seven days a week effort for that yeah. two year period yeah. in between, in between yeah. the two. Yeah, I can well believe that. Uh, having read it, I can well believe it required that kind of effort. Um, what, what reception has the book gotten from the medical, you mentioned the reception that the article had gotten. What reception has the book gotten from the medical community? From the medical community, the response has been uh, really positive. There are 
are we're, we're in conversation with many providers, many individual physicians talking with us, um, not so much about what are you saying or why do you say this, but the conversation has come to how do we do it? Yeah. What do we do next? What do we do now? So yeah. the conversation yeah. very rapidly shifted from what are you saying and why do you say it yeah. to yeah. how do we do this? Yeah. Help us get started. Yeah, uh, in other words, the. The facts had prepared the ground, and so when they saw the uh, the writing about it, it fell on uh, what's the opposite of fallow uh, ground? It fell on w w it's well fertile ground, totally, you yeah. know, prepared ground. Yeah, because yeah. the basic notion that the system needs to be about health and care, yeah. and that we need to be focused on improving value for patients, yeah. rings so true to yeah. people who are dedicating their careers and their lives yeah. in yeah. the health sector. Yeah, yeah, it is what they want. Uh, now, l let's talk about two things. Uh, well, number one, um, we'll get into specifics. I know in the book you say, and we discussed at lunch, and I've read articles about and so forth, uh, that what you're suggesting, almost every suggestion, maybe every single suggestion, is being done by somebody somewhere. So these are not uh, off-the-wall, novel, untried, uh, etc. And we'll get into the specifics of that as we go along. But I want to first discuss two of the most essential points. Uh, of your book. Uh, let's start out uh, with, with uh, we'll do it your way rather than mine. Let's, <laughs> let's start out with your uh, stress on obtaining value at what you call the medical condition level. What does that mean? How is that different from what is happening today? Mm -hmm. I'll back up just one step even beyond where you ask. Okay. The U.S. system has more competition than any other healthcare system in the world. And so the paradox for me and for Mike as we study strategy and innovation is why is it that competition in healthcare doesn't work like it does in other sectors? In other sectors you see you see competition and innovation driving f phenomenal improvements in quality and efficiency right. simultaneously. And yet we see in healthcare high costs, variable quality, high numbers of errors many millions of uninsured how you know why is this why is this happening this way and how can you change it what we um, what we c come to understand is that competition occurs on the wrong things and at the wrong levels you need competition to occur where value is created for patients and so competition needs to occur at the level of of patients medical conditions because that's where value is created for patients and that's how care needs to be organized. Can you give me an example, uh, Elizabeth? You can. Would you give me an example of um, how competition is focused on something wrong? Here, I'll, l l why don't you describe, if this is suitable, how competition among ho uh, hospitals is focused on the wrong thing because every hospital seeks to be, not every, but most, many at least, many seek to be full service hospitals and this is not good at all and leads to I ineffectiveness and so forth and you would redefine that competition rather seriously. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the right level, the, va the level at which value is created for patients, we call that the medical condition level, but we don't define that the way a medical school would or the way a hospital normally does. A medical condition from a patient's perspective is a set of interrelated medic medical circumstances that are best treated in an integrated way. And so from a, a medical school perspective, that might include multiple medical conditions. But if I have diabetes and hypertension, which thankfully I don't, but if I had diabetes and, and hypertension, from my perspective, that would be my medical condition. Okay. Okay. How so about if you have a heart problem? What would your medical condition be? Depend on the heart problem. Just but. Um, but if, um, you mean, if I in had that in addition to? Well, it, it, I'm just trying to get it, no, no uh, diabetes and... Uh, I mean, if I have congestive heart failure, yeah, then okay. that would be my medical condition. Okay. The point is that competition now, to your question, competition now is focused at the level of hospitals or the level of networks and systems. And so... Um, it's rather than focused on the individual, um, the medical condition from the patient's perspective. And so um, if, as you look at hospital to hospital comp competition, it obscures things that you don't want to obscure. No organization is equally good at all things, and so you don't want to 
you, you want to be able to compare outcomes at the level at which values created for patients, and you want care organized at the level that drives improvement in those value in, in value at that level. So, um, if you're com tra just trying to compare hospitals, and the hospital is trying to be full service, within that full service, it may inadvertently protect substandard providers in particular areas in the interest of providing everything. And what will drive value will be doing will be driving improvements in care at the level of specific conditions and comparing um, provider to provider how similar patients fare, what the outcomes are for so similar uh, patients. So to put, put this as briefly as I can, these days because of the uh, desire to be full service, something that has gone across the economy from say the 1960s onward, although there's a movement back today in other areas, but in, in, in in the desire to be full service, a hospital will do everything. Mm -hmm. Some things it does well, some things it does poorly. Right. Other hospitals are also full service, and the things that first does poorly, the other might do well. You shouldn't compare hospital to hospital. You should compare cardiac condition service to cardiac condition service, diabetes service to diabetes service, mm -hmm. and so forth. And you ought to look, all right, so that's number one. That's an example of how you ought to look at competition a little bit differently. Right, and think about that from the physician or the medical team's perspective. That's how they get insight about how to improve, right? You, if you're measuring <coughs> things at a hospital-wide level, the individual or the team has less influence on, on those numbers, those measures. But if you're looking at the performance of, um, the, of your patients, if you're looking at the outcomes for your patients, then you can get insight about how what you do contributes right. to how well your patients do right. And, right. Um, and develop insight about improvement and right. do better for your patients. Right, because right. so you are being compared, it's like comparing a first baseman to a first baseman, batting average, fielding average, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to comparing the Cubs to the Braves. I don't do sports at You don't do sports, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyhow, you're breaking it down. You're breaking it down into component parts, and you're comparing the component parts, which are more meaningful because then each component part <clears throat> being the sole measure of its competitive standing has a greater incentive to improve itself, whereas if it's just a tiny measure uh, of the hospital standing, it does not have the same incentive. Mm -hmm. Very much, well, I don't know, this is a little beside the point, very much like mutual funds which have 100 stocks versus mutual funds which have only 10 stocks, in which case each stock makes a big difference. 100 stocks doesn't make much difference. Yeah, you want to make sure that the, that, that the things you're measuring, the things you're competing on, the things you're trying to improve are the things that you can influence. Right. So medical team by medical right. team, they can influence the outcomes for the patients that they treat. Right. Right. And those are patients with particular uh, combinations of medical conditions, right. particular co-occurring medical circumstances. Right. Okay, now, we'll come back to that in a moment. Because I, uh, but first, I'd like to get to the other really major point uh, you call this the lever that can drive, that can do more than anything else can to drive improvement on this head-to-head -head competition at the medical condition level, hearts to hearts, diabetes to diabetes. And that is what you call outcome information. Explain what this information is and that some institutions are doing it now internally, some even externally, but in the main, we don't get this in medicine. Right. We want to be measuring results. We want to know, we want to be measuring results at the medical condition level. And right now there's a dearth of information at, at that level and a dearth of information about results in general. And we can talk about why if you want to. But there are some areas of care where there really is very good results information. It's, uh, and it's certainly been well proven that we can measure results and we can risk adjust for individual patient circumstances. Right. So we can develop good measures. But, we, but having information about how well patients do, about the health and health outcomes of patients, allows us to drive improvement and allows us to compare and to develop clinical insights about process improvement Okay, now, just the other day in the Boston Globe, there was an article uh, that said that the state of Massachusetts is going to begin uh, making publicly available information about cardiologists and cardi uh, cardiac surgery. Mm -hmm. 
And they said that based on the information they have, uh, most, most of the cardiac surgeons are roughly similar, but there are, quote, outliers who have left the state. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an example, is it not, of what can happen, what should happen, uh, when you provide the information to people about the outcomes that particular providers in diabetes, in back surgery, in uh, anything you care, cystic fibrosis, that when you begin to learn that some people are doing it well and some people aren't doing it so well, now you're beginning the information that's really usable to the patient, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so right, let's, let's dispel a couple of common myths. The traditional myth was that U.S. healthcare is expensive because it's high quality. Yeah. And, um, and people have treated medicine as if health services were a commodity, all equally good, distinguishable only by price. Right. And so the discussion about the system has been how to reduce price, how to lower cost. But the fact is that all medical care is not equally good, which is why looking at outcome measures is so important. And what the data show, as um, empirical studies have been done over the past decade or so, is that there's wide variation in both the processes used and the results obtained throughout the U.S. that the care that Americans get depends more on where they're diagnosed and treated than on the state of the art of medicine. So a lot of the practices aren't well attached right. to um, what we know works. And that on average, Americans get about 55% of the care that we know works. Right. So, I mean, that doesn't mean that some get full care and some don't. Those results were very robust across locations, across conditions, across patients. What it means is that when you or I or anyone shows up for care, we get only a fraction of yeah. what's known to work. So the point is there's wide variation in outcomes. Right. And it's important to understand those variations in order to improve care. Now, what we have to do, is it not, is create a situation in which outcome information about medicine about healthcare is pervasive in society because that would allow patients to make judgments about where to go and what to do, their primary physicians to help them make those judgments in a knowledgeable way, and would drive uh, doctors themselves to improve because along with the knowledge of who's, got, who's getting better outcomes, we'd be like, why are they getting better outcomes than this other fellow? This other fellow better start doing what they're doing. Yeah, and it's that third point that's so critical. So back to your example about Massachusetts starting to report outcomes yeah. for heart surgery. For starting in the early 90s, Pennsylvania and New York um, started reporting outcomes for specific types of heart surgery. Right. Several things happened. The first thing is that in the first four years of outcome reporting in New York, mortality for coronary artery bypass graft surgery, which is what they were reporting on, declined 41 percent. Wow. You know, phenomenal improvement in outcomes um, when the outcome reporting was, was public. Second thing that happened um, as a result of that is can, that... Can I make... Yeah? That means that certain doctors suddenly got religion, right? I mean, you want to put it in bluntest terms, that's what it means, right? It means several things. It means that people started paying attention to are there ways we can improve. Yeah. It means, it also means that some people started saying that they wouldn't operate on certain patients. Um, if those patients were too complex for them to get a good result, they referred them someplace else. People often talk about that as a problem, but if you can't treat my medical condition yeah. well, if it's too complex yeah. for what you know how to do, please yeah. send me to someone who right. can do better. Right. So that, that's, um, that's part of it. Right. What it didn't mean, which is interesting, what it didn't mean is that patients were shopping patients tended to be pretty unaware of the data that was out there or seemed to be not paying as much attention to it, but they benefit tremendously right. when mortality declines 41% right. in the right. first four years. Right. So right. your point about doctors improving when they can see the numbers is a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have to go to break, but before we do, I want to cover two other things and we'll just postpone the break. One is that uh, early on at least, perhaps even up to this day. Doctors often rejected uh, the publication of outcome information because, quite frankly, some of them would look bad. 
and therefore we weren't getting it. And it's absolutely essential to get. But one legitimate complaint that was raised by institutions such as teaching hospitals was that, yes, they will have worse results because they have, if I may put it this way, more difficult patients. Their patients are much further gone, as it were, already. But that can be taken account of in the figures, can it not? Yes. Um, you can risk adjust, is the term for that. You can risk adjust, take account, take into account the condition of the patient as the patient comes in. And there are a number of complex areas of care where we've done this. The Society of Thoracic Surgeons, largely in response to the public reporting of outcome measures, yeah. has developed very sophisticated risk adjustment algorithms to understand a wide range of cardiac surgeries. And so you, ca you can risk adjust. And actually, there's been um, very good work on this in, um, in a number of fields, in, um, in intensive care, um, in, uh, in management of, of end-stage renal disease, um, in cystic Kidney fibrosis. Kidney disease. Um, yes. Yeah, um, yeah you, you, can, you can risk adjust. And so um, that's not a reason for us not to do it. One of the things right. that you right. note is that as you start using outcome measures, our efforts to and success with risk adjusting well improves very rapidly. Right, right, the right. If you would tell a story before we go to break, this, this is not precisely germane to your, your point, I guess, because there's certain different factors involved, I think, but it's analogous at minimum. What hap tell what happened in anesthesiology when they began to look, well, frankly, at outcomes. One, one person in 500 was dying right. on the operating table from anesthesi uh, anesthesiological mistakes. Which, when I heard about this, that this was going on in the 1980s and 90s, uh, I mean, growing up in the 40s, as I said, I thought that by the uh, 1940s, nobody died from anesthesia anymore. One person in 500 was dying. Explain what they did. Right. In the 80s, the death rate um, from complications during anesthesia were, were very high. It's about 1 in 500. And it has actually improved to be 1 in 200,000 or 1 in 300,000. And the change was driven by, um, by requests by the anesthesiologists for suppliers to, um, to change, to make it so that up was always the same direction on the valve so that you couldn't accidentally turn the valve in the wrong direction to make it so the diameters of hoses were different for different gases, so you couldn't inadvertently connect to the wrong gas, to make it so that the, the drugs had different um, shapes of bottles, shapes, not just labels, right. so that it was easier to tell them apart. Right. And they right. adopted oximetry and capnography, which enable you to measure the blood gas levels for a patient yeah. so that you can measure and monitor that. Right. And you got phenomenal increases in safety and value. It's a great example of innovation that uh, was right. driven to improve value for patients and improve safety right. for patients. And, and it all started because they started measuring a particular outcome, number of deaths per patient. They said, we can't have this. So they figured out what better practices are, or in the terms you use, the processes, mm -hmm. what the better processes are. And they spread that around, said, everybody's got to do this. And uh, they improved by a fact, if it's 200,000 to one, at 200,000, they improve by a factor of 400, and if it's six, uh, 300,000, they improve by a factor of 600. And of course, that also brought their malpractice uh, costs down tremendously. Yeah, yeah. You know, and as a patient, I value uh, my odds going up from 1 in 500 to 1 in 300,000. You got it. Results matter. Yeah, you bet they do. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Professor Teisberg and more on what she and Professor Porter think should be done in healthcare. <laughs> Right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take care. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Make sure you stay with her the whole time. She's new to the country. This is her first Mom. day. This Mom. is a brand Mom. new country. Mom. It's a whole different it's culture. Be okay. Now make sure you stay with her the whole time. I'll be here right okay. after school to pick you up. Okay, Mom. Okay, have fun. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Ignore my mom. She's so annoying. She's totally freaking out about this whole thing. She freaks out about She always does that. Oh. Ignore my mom. So, you ready for your first day in the wicked castle of doom? I mean, like, seriously, it's so boring. Like every single day. How many schools do you have in your village? None. Welcome back. Uh, Elizabeth, um, what are some of the organizations that are creating these risk-adjusted metrics, if I may use that word, uh, and uh, what are the, some of the uh, uh, problems, well, not the problems, but why do, uh, are the organizations which are creating them different from the organizations that are actually using them? The measures are created by physicians. It needs to be physicians who have the insight about, um, about how you know when it's working. You know, in some things it's relatively obvious when, as you think about what metrics one might use to measure outcomes in surgery. It's not just mortality, perhaps it's range of movement, time before you're back to work, can you climb the stairs? There are all kinds of questions you know, one might ask for Pain. metrics. Pain, sure. Um, uh, 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 lots of metrics one might use for that. They're less obvious in rheumatology, dermatology, and yet if I'm a practicing yeah, rheumatologist, yeah, yeah. I know when I'm doing well. So yeah. one of the things you want to do is, is ask physicians to develop these measures. There are a couple of ways that that's happening. One is in the medical societies. Yeah, so yeah. the American Society of Breast Surgeons or the um, or the Society of Thoracic Surgeons are developing measures and working on how to correctly reliably right. risk adjust those measures. Right. Um, and then you also have leading organizations um, like the Cleveland Clinic saying we're going to measure outcomes in every area of care. Yeah. And they're yeah. actually reporting outcomes on their website. And as you look, there are some very sophisticated risk adjusted outcome measures. In some areas, the, the measures that they're reporting right now are far less sophisticated, yeah. but yeah. they're doing it. And yeah. they're doing it in all areas of care to push the state of the art forward. Right. Right. Now, there are also, are there not, uh, groups which exist for the purpose of using this kind of information to advise mm -hmm. patients uh, where they might get better results at less cost or where they might get uh, worse, worse results at higher cost. The two things you have constantly said tend to work in tandem, which is maybe counterintuitive, but more expensive care is often worse care. But, right. but uh, what, what organization, describe some of the organizations which are advising patients by using information of this nature. Right. Um, yeah, they're both the two sorts of questions. One is, yes. one is how are patients using it, and this is another is how, is, how are doctors using it. Yes. And the, okay. use of, the use of outcomes, as you mentioned earlier, outcomes information by doctors is a really critical driving force here as well. 
With patients, there are, there are a Be number because. of... Because? Because that drives process improvement. If we pay attention to outcomes, the atti then the, the efforts to improve processes become animated. Okay. And so we, there are two general kinds of approaches. One is to measure and report appropriately risk-adjusted, appropriately vetted outcome measures. And the other is to try to control processes. And we'll never succeed by trying to control all the processes. It's well, let me go back to something, if I may. Uh, yeah, forgive me for rudely interrupting, but I, 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 I want you to make a point here. They do this in Sweden, and it's worked very well, and doctors who don't score so high on results are driven both by competitive pressure and by personal pride to change their, what, you, what in the medical profession they call processes, I would call it practices, same thing. You know, what medicine do you give them when, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. that, what kind of treatment do you give them, et cetera, et cetera. So this actually has been shown to work in Sweden. It makes all doctors better. Well, yeah, the point is that if you're publicly reporting outcomes, and the, the, the measures that they report in Sweden are a combination of processes and outcomes. They're not way ahead of us in terms of okay. um, what outcome measures they have. Okay. But the outcome measures they have and the process measures they use are publicly reported. And so right. there's tremendous effort in the medical community to do well on the things that are publicly reported, right. you know, for reasons of professionalism. Right. Um, no one wants to be in the bottom 25%, yeah. perhaps yeah. not in you the know, bottom You know, somebody 75%. ranked us and said, well, gee, uh, you two folks are the, the uh, worst uh, business and law professors in the country. We start thinking, hey, we ought <laughs> to do something about this. Right. And then there's also, you know, caring about your patients. When they started comparing results in cystic fibrosis, the average lifespan for cystic fibrosis patients was 18 years. But when they started comparing results and realized that there was enormous variation in care, teams caring for patients with cystic fibrosis wanted to and started working very hard to push their results up because at that time the, the best teams had much longer lifespans. The average lifespan for cystic fibrosis patients has gone up to 33 years and at the best centers it's 47. Yeah. So by comparing outcomes and creating um, public attention to, the, um, to those outcomes, the teams have worked very hard to, Im to improve and their patients are better off and the doctors and the teams yeah. providing yeah. that care are better yeah. off. Yeah. Everyone's better yeah. off as that now happens. That, that goes very much to what you were saying with the second aspect, how do patients use this right. or, uh, and therefore how do their, or I should say by, uh, by parity, how these advisor groups use it. Right, so in, in Sweden and in cystic fibrosis, there's not much shopping because in Sweden, by the patients, because there in Sweden, primary and secondary care happen within a given lawn, so there's not much, a given region, so there's not much choice. Um, and in, in cystic fibrosis is a chronic disease of childhood. It's not that people are shopping and moving to different places. But there's also the dynamic of, of patients uh, or referring doctors more likely using right. information to try to right. get people to the right place. One of the nice examples in that right now is in transplants. In transplants, we have universally collected outcome data. You can't get an organ unless you report outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's peer-reviewed, it's checked and vetted, and it's publicly reported on the web. But it's not enough to just throw the numbers on the web because it's hard to understand what do these mean. It's multidimensional. How much does waiting time matter? How much does um, graph survival matter relative to um, three-year patient survival? How do you think about these things? Yeah. So there are organizations that coach patients about this. So your health plan may contract with one of these organizations or may have in-house one of these organizations. And heaven forbid, should you need a heart transplant, they'll refer you to one of these groups. What that group will do is show you the outcome measures and, um, and talk with you about what the multiple dimensions of that mean. They'll also talk to you about your out-of-pocket costs mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. you use different providers. Mm -hmm. And you can choose. In heart transplants, for example, the the variation in one-year mortality ranges from 100% of patients, virtually 100% of patients surviving for a year to places that have only done a few cases and no patients have survived yet. Right. Once you're aware of those kinds of numbers and once you're aware of differences in waiting times, 
you have strong preferences yeah. about where you might like to go for care. Right, right. So they've learned several things. They've learned that um, they've learned that patients will make uh, real choices and and may travel for care when there are big differences in outcomes. Sure. No one in their right mind will travel for care if there aren't. Sure. Um, they've also learned that the patients don't all queue up at one place because it's multi-dimensional and because patients have different preferences and values they array themselves over a range of providers there's no such thing as one best team or one best physician I mean somebody might want somebody might prefer a surgical treatment somebody else might prefer a non surgical non-invasive treatment right not for a heart transplant yeah. usually but for in other areas yeah. of care that's certainly true so you have um, also have places that um, for specific diseases do counseling on on the treatment types and then the trade-offs with those treatment types. Right. And so you may say, okay, well, I would rather have faced this set of risks and this set of responsibilities right. than this set. Right. And so you have a, right. and then within that treatment type, you can look at the quality of outcomes for providers because for a different type of treatment, different providers yeah. have more experience yeah. and yeah. Um, greater. Well, why greater don't you excellence. discuss? Uh, speaking of experience, why don't you discuss the impact of experience? Uh, uh, on health care, both in terms of the quality of the care and in terms of the cost of the care. All of this is counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. The quip, of course, is practice makes perfect, yeah. but it's much more sophisticated than that overall. It matters that a team has experience, um, and as the team moves up an experience curve, learning drives excellence. So it's not necessarily volume that drives excellence, but learning drives excellence. And the learning is shared among a team, not necessarily just for a, a particular physician, but learning among a team. And what that, sh what that, what you, s there are hundreds and hundreds of studies about how learning drives excellence. And so there are lots of different things that we have, that one learns about that over time. One interesting thing is that the threshold for good care is not all that high. You don't have to have done um, thousands and thousands of cases to be over the threshold of providing good care. So that's one thing. Another thing is that um, no hospital is equally good at everything or no provider group is equally good at everything. And, um, and it's also not true that in general community hospitals are worse than teaching hospitals, for example. So in things that community hospitals do regularly, they tend to do with uh, good quality and good efficiency. Um, teaching hospitals, again, will have those kind of results for things that they do regularly and especially on right. things where they right. learn actively. So teaching hospitals tend to be better at extending, ex extending things to more complex situations. Right, right, right. right. Uh, one of the points you make is that because all, not again, not all, many hospitals seek to be all things, you get very, very expensive equipment, which is basically sitting there fallow most of the time, which is very wasteful, and which uh, means that the doctors in that hospital are not having experience with the particular kinds of problems which this equipment is designed to help them solve. So that's also, that's another example of the waste we're getting in medicine. Uh, and another, yet another point you make about the structure of a hospital and this is a, all a matter of structure of the hospital that I've been talking about, uh, is that a hospital would l look very different, as it were, because a, lot, a, a broad range of specialists would all be involved in a single field. Wh why don't you explain that? Yeah. Well, the, the redefinition that needs to take place is to have the, um, the structure of care delivery around medical conditions from a patient's perspective over the full cycle of care. So all the way from prevention and early stage treatment and diagnosis through treatment and uh, disease management or uh, rehabilitation, but over the full cycle of care. And that's a very different type of organization to organize by medical condition over the full cycle of care. There are some places doing it. So you have um, the MD Anderson Cancer Center is organized by type of cancer. And so rather than have just um, organization by functional specialties, by anesthesiology, by surgery, you have organization um, and location of physicians and patients 
by type of cancer, or the Cleveland Clinic is building specialized facilities um, in their Eye Institute and their Heart Institute to focus care and organize care from the perspective of the patient's medical condition. And that, there are all kinds of, of, of efficiency and quality improvements that are enabled by a virtuous circle of, of attention to, uh, to particular groups of patients with particular co-occurring conditions. So you end up with more experience in a, a, a set of patients, uh, faster learning, you can have more dedicated facilities, more dedicated teams. You can have more specialization on what type of back surgery or what type of heart surgery you do, but simultaneously you'll get um, a broader range of expertise over the cycle of care and over the types of co-occurring conditions that those patients experience. Yep. So, uh, if I may put it this way, uh, if, you had, if you had a heart condition, you'll have an institution or a wing of an institution devoted to congestive heart failure. In that, you will have examining cardiologists, surgeons, anesthesiologists, uh, uh, I guess also a variety of blood people and, and so forth. Uh, you'll have a variety of people. I, I should think, frankly, you'd have psychiatrists too because the aftermath of heart surgery is desperately terrible uh, often. Uh, so all those people would be part of a dedicated wing of the hospital or a dedicated entire institution devoted just to this problem. Whereas if you go to another hospital, well, you go to this wing for surgery, you go to that wing for anesthesiology, you go somewhere else uh, for the examination of your heart and so on and so forth. Yeah, from the patient's perspective, care delivery is not just fragmented right now, it's fractured. But if you think about the organization of a group like the Boston Spine Group, which came together and said, look, we're going to separate ourselves from the morass of unnecessary back surgery. We're going to demonstrate our outcomes, we're going to improve our outcomes, and we're going to um, develop a dedicated team. So they have dedicated anesthesiologists and dedicated nurses and dedicated radiologists, and they're working um, consistently with the same you know, group of physical therapists, and they're learning as a team and pushing their learning. Their outcomes are improving even as they take uh, m more and more yeah, complicated yeah, patients. Yeah. You know, it's just a matter of a fundamental, basic, primitive organizational uh, structure and theory that when people are working together, they talk about the problems, they learn more about the problems, so that if you're talking to uh, uh, an anesthesiologist and then a surgeon, all of whom's on the same floor, so to speak, office right down the hall, you're going to be comparing experiences, getting suggestions, whereas if they're off in some other wing, hey, that's a different world. So this is a whole different way of organizing a structure. It is a different way of organizing a structure. And then you get the whole team focused on the outcome for the patients over the cycle of care so that you're not looking at fragmented pieces of outcomes. You know, one of the problems in our system now is that we look, for example, at the effects of drugs separately from the effects of surgery. But from the patient's perspective, you need those things integrated. You need to figure out what's the full course of treatment that's most effective. W would so you, you explain what together. you mean? Because you keep, you keep using this phrase, and it's crucial, but explain precisely what you mean by the cycle of care. Mm -hmm. The cycle of care of a disease goes from prevention, which we pay way too little attention to now, through diagnosis. Which is like the examination in the first place, to see if you've got something that might be coming up. Well, if you're at risk, if you're at risk for things, okay. you may need okay. um, counseling, coaching about lifestyle changes right. that would reduce your risk of ever getting that. Or don't eat so much rotten food. Well, maybe um, you think most people in the U.S. whose kidneys fail have never seen a nephrologist who would mm. be a specialist who could help them to figure out how to manage their chronic kidney disease so that they they don't their, their kidneys don't fail. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know. We need, we need more, we need the care to be thought about over the full cycle, not just in acute episodes. And so you need to think about prevention and disease management and diagnosis and treatment um, and, you know, a recovery or rehabilitation or ongoing disease yeah. management so yeah. that we're managing the progression of disease, not just the acute episodes. Yeah. So that when you get this kind of cycle of care treatment, at, a, uh, at a wing or a whole institution dedicated to one medical condition, be it 
heart disease, be it uh, 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 diabetes, be it, you, and then you compare their out, risk adjusted outcome measures. Now you're really starting to uh, cook with gas, as we used to say 70 years ago, you know? I mean, you really begin to understand who's doing what better, and other people can begin to use the same practices as the, per as the institution that's doing well. That's what this is really all about. Right, but you don't have to have a whole institution. You can still, you still will definitely have multi-specialty institution and multi-condition institutions. The point is that they need to be comparing their results right. at the medical condition level, right. so that we're comparing apples to apples and then figuring out how to drive right. rapid improvement right. in the care cycles for those conditions. Right, uh, Elizabeth, uh, they have been madly uh, 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 signaling me to go to the next break. So uh, having used up most of our time, we'll go to the next break, but we will have another five or eight minutes left, I'm sure. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Uh Elizabeth, um, now that we're back, uh, there is often a, 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 a criticism that's been raised of what you and Porter have said. I, I don't personally think it's well taken, but it's certainly one that's in people's minds, is that your suggestions will lead to what might be called a two-class system of medicine, uh, one for the rich and one for the poor, uh, overlooking the fact that is clearly what we have now, uh, which of course can't be overlooked and we have 40 million uninsured, which makes it only worse. But over, overlooking those things, if one can, what is your response to that? Yeah, it's exactly the opposite. Two things. The first is our research leads to the inescapable conclusion that everyone has to be in the system. And uh, as a nation, we have to provide subsidies or vouchers for those who need it, and we need to require that everyone is in the system. We need universal coverage. Well, uh, how are What's we going to pay for everyone being in the system? Let's ask you other question first. Okay. The, um, and then we'll do that one. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> you know, law professors are used to having their questions answered, but you go ahead. <laughs> well, I'll ask you first one first, which is no, that how ahead. do we avoid having that be two-class care? And the answer there is today we have, we do, as you say, we have two-class care or worse. We have, you know, enormous disparities in care um, and a lot of people with very, very poor access. We have a lot of disparities in care that no one knows about. As we report outcomes publicly, that'll become transparent. And it's completely unacceptable to everyone when the, tra when the disparities in care are transparent. So outcome reporting has to be done to prevent uh, these kinds of disparities in care. And, um, and it will be tremendous, tremendously helpful. And with everyone in the system, some of the disparities in care um, will be reduced right there. But we do need to step up to the plate on that. Yeah. The interesting thing about health care is that unlike other sectors, better health care is inherently less expensive in a number of ways. First, the good here is not treatment but health. And good health is less expensive than poor health. And then second, think about all the ways that quality improvement drives down cost. And there's lots of empirical documentation of this. But um, fewer mistakes and repeats cost less. Faster recovery costs less. Less long-term disability costs less. Correct diagnosis in the first place costs less. Specific examples, if you think about it right now, for stroke care, 
patients are often required to be taken to the nearest hospital. But only some hospitals have the ability to um, break up the clot for a, large, for a large ischemic stroke. If it's a small stroke, it won't matter much where you go. But if it's a large stroke, it does matter. A stroke is the leading cause of long-term disability in this country. The long-term care is phenomenally expensive. So getting patients to the right place for the early stage care that could break up the clot and prevent the long-term disability uh, would be a phenomenal improvement. So what it comes down to in a certain sense, uh, although there are other things involved too, uh, is that if you can stop people from getting sick in the first place, if you can catch it early on if they do get sick, if you can give them the right treatment early on rather than the wrong treatment, all of this is going to lower cost because the sooner you get it and the more, right, uh, the more rightly you do it, the cheaper the cost in the long term. Mm -hmm. Now that leads me to the 40 million who are uninsured. We are engaging today, if I understand you right, in what in the book you very properly call cost shifting. Because when these people get sick, they go to emergency rooms, at which point it's usually a late stage, but why don't you elaborate what happens and how, in effect, the cost is simply being shifted from insurance companies or whomever to whoever finances the emergency rooms in those hospitals. Right. Not getting the right treatment to the right people at the right time turns out to be very expensive over the medium and long term. And one of the things, in our system today, we have the most dysfunctional form of universal coverage, if you can even call it that. Because if you show up in an emergency room with an advanced problem, you get care. But you, we don't have access for everyone to earlier stage care. And emergency, the emergency room is an expensive place to provide care, and having it so that people don't show up until their disease is advanced makes it harder to treat them effectively or efficiently. So it's, it's the structure of the system leads to worse quality and higher costs. We need everyone in the system um, with a health plan. And we just have to step but up to the plate on you that. See, you say higher costs. It is higher costs, but it's also a different payer, correct? It's, for example, tax revenues, the taxpayer who's paying, rather than the insurance company. There's a phenomenal amount of cost shifting. The dysfunctional oh, wait, competition. That's a crucial word, cost shifting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. There's a phenomenal amount of cost shifting in the system today. Right now, the competition that we have is not competition about improving the care for patients, the outcomes for patients over, you know, for their medical condition. Right now, the competition is largely competition to shift costs from one person to another. So we have cost shifting, you know, um, from the hospital to the health plan and back again, from the health plan to now, the member and back uh, how, again. How does, that, how does that cost shifting work, from the hospital to the health plan? Well, that's a bargaining power game. The hospital tries to make sure that it has locked up enough of the local providers to be able to say that it can do everything. And so as it bargains with the, with the health plan, um, it has more bargaining power there. and it, and. it um, to cut a better deal with the health plan. Then the health plan needs that provider group, and, um, and so they have more power so in the negotiation. it pays more, the cost gets shifted to it, and then it tries to save money and save costs by, by denials. Why don't you explain how that, you know, what that, by denials of care and so forth. The health plans? Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the health plans have traditionally operated under what they term a culture of denial, denying claims, denying responsibility, denying payment. Uh, but it needs to shift to health plans understanding themselves not as payers whose job is to cost shift, but as health plans whose job is to enable health for patients. One of the really interesting things here is that, um, and health plans are, tr are working on making this shift, and one of the really interesting things that's going on is as they look at what happens when they identify really high quality care, care with good outcomes, they're discovering that that tends to be lower cost care, empirically, as they look at their, da as they look at their databases, because there are so many ways in which better care reduces costs. In addition to the ways that you and I talked about a moment ago, throughout the country, throughout the world, uh, much of the care that's delivered is behind 
best practices, even behind accepted practices. And in any business or service, when the, um, the practices are behind best practices, there are phenomenal opportunities Can for improvement a question about in quality that? and efficiency. Now, I'm interrupting you, but I, 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 and I, uh, excuse me, I, I, I'm, I'm pretending that I'm a ma major network, uh, you know, interrupted person all the time. How does this happen in the medical world? These are among the most highly, the doctors are among the most highly educated people in the country. They take a Hippocratic oath. They uh, work like dogs, 60 and 70 and 80 hours a week. And their practices, I think you had in other times you've said here or at lunch, that you get only, that, that on average people get only 55% of the kinds of medical care they should be getting. In other words, the, the practices that should be used upon them are not used. How does this happen in this field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the coolest thing about doing this research is the people I've met in the process. You're right, that, that throughout the health sector, there are smart, dedicated, hardworking people. That's not the problem. Um, but we don't have good dissemination of knowledge about what works. And right now, as we require every doctor to do everything, it's very, very, very hard to keep up. So I mean, there's too part, much. There's too much. And part of it is that, that because we're not continually exploring outcomes and thinking about what enables improvement in those outcomes, people don't know. So a good, well-intended doctor fills his or her schedule and fills hospital beds um, to fully use all the resources at his or her disposal. But the kinds of errors that go on in the system include over-provision of care as well as under-provision of care and inappropriate provision of care because it's not based on uh, good, solid Fundamentally, I think you practices. said to me because they don't know what works this, because of lack of dissemination. And then there's also, unfortunately, this other aspect that people are paid by the number of visits, you know, the, the number of patients, number of visits, number of procedures, and some of this is just wasteful. Yeah. Well, there are a tremendous number of skewed incentives for absolutely everybody in the system. Yeah. Mike and I wrote a paper about that over a decade ago, and part of what got us going on this current research was the notion that it was so hard for people to fix the skewed incentives. And that's what drove us to realizing that it was the nature of competition, the kind of competition going on, that not only drives these wildly dysfunctional outcomes in the system of high costs combined with variable quality and high rates of errors, but, um, but so you not you not only have you know you not only have that going on, but it's hard to fix the incentives, yeah. and that's because yeah. we don't have the right kind yeah. of competition going on. I think you on. find uh, that there's something, or your figures lead to something like there might be two hundred thousand or more unnecessary deaths in the system every year from medical mistakes. The numbers that the Institute of Medicine reported as they were as they were looking at you know, death rates from medical errors um, and the numbers that have been reported since then would show that it's the equivalent of crashing a large plane in the United States you know, daily. Can you answer something in uh, 20 seconds? If not, we, I, I've been told to wrap it up. Are the medical schools reacting well and adopting your suggestions as part of their training? The medical schools? The medical schools. It's early to know that. What we're seeing right now is um, a lot of providers, a lot of hospitals, a lot of individual physicians adopting um, practices or announcing that this is going to drive their strategy going forward. So you have the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic and MD Anderson and TheaCare and Park Nicolette. You have a variety of, of, of um, individual doctors or small group yeah, practices yeah. saying we're going to do this. You have major health plans saying we are going to measure our success on the health of our patients. Yeah, which would be a yeah, major yeah, change yeah. From, maj from measuring on cost reduction. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you have you know, the government saying, we are going to move to measure outcomes, yeah, not yeah, just processes, yeah. although they're not doing that I yet. I've got to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Very, very enlightening, I hope, for the audience. To the audience, thank you for being with us. Be with us again next time.